On May the 31st, 1978, Tony Castro, a security guard, was shot dead at point-blank range. His killers stole the £200,000 weekly payroll from the Daily Mirror. At least one of the suspected raiders should have been in prison awaiting trial after their arrest for robbing a bank in which another guard was shot. But they had bought their freedom by paying detectives £80,000. Two weeks ago, these two City of London detectives, Chief Inspector Philip Cuthbert on the left and ex-Detective Sergeant John Goldborn, were jailed for selling bail and dropping evidence against one of London's most violent gangs. These were the only two convictions secured by these detectives from Operation Countryman, the fourth and largest investigation by a team of outside officers into Dr Cuthbert and held him in custody over a weekend at Poole Police Station, Dorset. We arrested Cuthbert on a holding charge. It was to do with stolen property, which we suspected he had been keeping. We wanted him out of the way because we thought he had been squaring witnesses and also interfering with some honest policemen who might be able to give us evidence. My officers also wished to interrogate him about information that we thought he had, about senior officers who had been receiving bribes, not only in the city, but in the Met as well. So you thought that by keeping him in custody, uh, that might encourage him to talk? We thought it might do. The DPP, Sir Thomas Hetherington, was said to be furious when word reached him that Cuthbert had been remanded in custody. Sir Thomas later ordered that no evidence be offered against him. The DPP protested about Cuthbert's arrest by countrymen, as the following letter shows. I feel bound to express my concern at the arrest and subsequent remand in police custody of Detective Chief Inspector Cuthbert. Whether Detective Chief Inspector Cuthbert will seek further compensation by way of civil proceedings remains to be seen. This man, Detective Chief Superintendent Steve Whitby, the third most senior Operation Countryman officer, pleaded with one of the DPP's representatives not to drop the theft charge against Chief Inspector Cuthbert. Whitby warned the DPP that his action would undermine Countryman's credibility with some criminals who they wanted to give evidence against corrupt officers even though they risked incriminating themselves in the process. But the DPP went ahead and dropped the charge. We were the last to be told of the director's decision. In contrast, the first to be told was Cuthbert's solicitor. That finally indicated to me that we were not going to get the help and support that I expected. My chaps had worked very, very hard cultivating the informants. And at a stroke, that confidence in us was lost. The criminals thought, what's the good of us giving this evidence if the DPP isn't going to prosecute when we have policemen locked up? I was angry about this, and I complained the Home Office. The biggest showdown between Mr Hambleton, the Yard and the DPP, came at a meeting at New Scotland Yard on December the 7th, 1979. Present at that meeting were the DPP himself and Patrick Kavanagh, Deputy Commissioner of the Yard. They wanted us to put out a statement saying that there'd been total cooperation with the Yard and the DPP and that there had been no obstruction. I refused. I said there'd been obstruction all along and I gave them some examples. One example Mr Hamilton gave involved this man, Commander Donald Neesham, who had resigned as head of the Flying and Robbery Squad eight months earlier. Commander Neesham denies he ever obstructed countrymen, but Mr Hamilton insists that he did. I said, what about this man Neesham? He'd obstructed us. And Pat Kavanagh, the man responsible for discipline at Yard, said, what do you mean? I said, I will tell you. He's encouraged his men not to cooperate with us. He has signed reports questioning our integrity, and he thought all his men were clean. Whereas by this time, my detectives were convinced that some of them were guilty. When Kavanagh heard this, he said, well, we move Neesham for you. Now, this was quite news to me. 
because the public statement had said that Neesham left the force for a reason unconnected with countrymen. Now at this same meeting, the DPP said that he would have to resign his office if I persisted in my statements that he and his staff hadn't supported us. Eventually, Countryman and Scotland Yard issued the following press statement. Suggestions that the Countryman investigations have been obstructed are completely without truth. Reluctantly, I approve that statement, which I knew to be untrue in part. But I did it to try and keep the operation together. That was my priority, because relations between the DPP and the Yard and me had got so bad that the investigation was in jeopardy. The DPP has told us, as has Mr Kavanagh, that uh, no conversation about Commander Neesham or obstruction took place at that meeting on December the 7th. That's not true. If Mr Kavanagh and the DPP go back and check, they will find that that conversation did take place. And both Mr Kavanagh and the DPP also say that, in fact, you've never, ever complained about obstruction at any time. This is quite wrong. As I've explained already, I registered complaints, and at one stage I got, the st I got to where I complained the Home Office. Amid renewed allegations in the past fortnight of yard corruption, Sir David McNee, the Commissioner, referred to that December 7th statement denying that Countryman had been obstructed and said, It is apparently not enough that in December 1979, the officer then in charge of the inquiry issued a statement categorically denying that the inquiry had been obstructed. So the Yard's statements that you never complained about obstruction are less than frank? They are just not true. They're a lie. They are not true. But this December 7th statement had already formed the basis for a series of parliamentary statements in 1980 by the Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers. Like Sir David McNee and the DPP, Sir Michael has consistently denied that Countryman was ever obstructed or ever complained of obstruction. Given Mr Hamilton's evidence that Detective Chief Inspector Cuthbert obstructed the inquiry, evidence in court that Commander Moore tipped off Cuthbert, and the alleged obstruction by Commander Neesham, the former head of the Flying Squad, Sir Michael's parliamentary answer on February 25th, 1980, might seem strange. There is no... Uh, truth at all. And I've looked into this with the greatest care that any member of, uh, any senior member of the Metropolitan Police or the City Police who are equally involved uh, in this inquiry have taken any kind of blocking action at all. At about this time, Pat Kavanagh started asking for the files, our files that is, on the many Met officers that we're investigating. He said we are spreading our net too wide and things were getting out of hand. I felt I couldn't give him these files. It was a breach of trust between us and the men who had made the statement. Countrymen officers feared that if confidential information given by witnesses fell into the Yard's hands, it might reach corrupt officers who would take revenge, intimidate witnesses and destroy vital evidence. In order to build up the confidence of the informants, we had said right from the very start that we would restrict, we would respect their confidence and that we would keep what they told us within the confines of the countryman inquiry. None of the informants wanted what they told us to be handed to the yard. So you objected to Mr Kavanagh having your files. What did he say to you? Well, we had a bit of a row and he referred it to the Director of Public Prosecutions. There was something in the nature of a test case. It was about an informant called Davis. He was a man who had established a link with half a dozen or so metropolitan officers by entertaining them in the hope of receiving their favours. But he had told my officers he would only give information if we kept it to ourselves and didn't pass it on to the yard. And this was reinforced by a letter from his solicitor to me, confirming this decision that we must investigate this case and no one else. But the DPP ruled in favour of the Yard. His office wrote to Countryman... 
the director considers that the commissioner is entitled to call for the papers relating to the complaints made by Mr Davies and the papers in any similar cases. The DPP ruled against us and we then had to hand over to the yard any new cases that came to our notice. The effect of the director's decision was disastrous. We were relying on the informants trusting us. We gave them our promise that what they told us we would deal with. And when we got this ruling, the criminals clamped up because the whole thing, the whole success of the operation depended on the independence of the operation from Scotland Yard. In March 1980, Scotland Yard took direct operational control of the inquiry into its own metropolitan officers. Arthur Hambleton retired and his right-hand man, Leonard Burt, the assistant chief constable of Dorset, returned home. He was replaced by a serving Scotland Yard officer. Hambleton's job also went to a former Yard man, Sir Peter Matthews, chief constable of Surrey. Four countrymen detectives from Northamptonshire resigned in protest from the inquiry when Scotland Yard told Sir Peter to concentrate his inquiries on the city alone and not the Yard. By the time the Yard took over, 90 officers had been seconded to countrymen from 13 provincial forces to investigate the ever-lengthening list of corruption allegations. Sir Peter ordered all but a handful of the detectives to return home, 10 of them from Devon and Cornwall, whose chief constable was John Alderson. When Scotland Yard and Sir Peter Matthews took over the inquiry, the first intimation I had that it was going to be wound down was a fairly bland letter telling me that my officers, ten of them, were being returned to the force. I was somewhat perturbed about this and uh, suspected that the whole operation was becoming, to some extent, uh, embarrassing, and I replied to the effect that I thought uh, that political reasons were behind the winding down of the exercise. What did you mean by political reasons? By political reasons, uh, one means that uh, the Home Office, of course, responsible for the administration of the Metropolitan Police, were finding, I think, that the whole uh, inquiry was uh, reaching such dimensions that it became embarrassing. And I knew the Home Secretary and a previous Minister of State, Lord Harris, had said that uh, uh, Countryman was probably uh, uh, getting into channels that it was never intended to do, that is, deep into the Metropolitan Pleas, and that uh, it was unlikely there would ever be another uh, countryman exercise, at least like that. You met uh, William Whitelaw, did you? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, I, I met the Home Secretary, uh, not for this particular reason, but for another reason, and um, we were talking generally. And there his feeling was that countrymen hadn't been in success, or it wasn't doing what it was supposed to have done? I got the impression that countrymen was not pleasing uh, the Home Office at that time. But why exactly? I think they were not pleasing the Home Office because the inquiry was widening and, and, and it was becoming so much more serious than ever anybody contemplated in the first place. Countryman was there to inquire into two crimes, really, two big robberies. But within weeks, the flood of information was of such a proportion that many chief constables in the provinces were having to send more and more reinforcements to help to keep this uh, operation going. And it was becoming something of a scandal. Once the Yard took over, they seized all countrymen, secret information and witness statements. They covered at least 84 metropolitan officers suspected of corruption and unchecked allegations against a further 107 officers. This information was stored on computers at the West Sussex County Council's headquarters in Chichester in the strictest secrecy. Only the computer manager knew the code to activate the disks. Scotland Yard was never intended to see them. And after I retired, the Metropolitan Police had access to the computer. This was a bad move because it virtually gave everything that we had up from the informants to the yard, which they had asked us not to do. There were nearly 4,000 statements and reports on that computer, plus a lot of odd bits of important information. But the yard would say that most of your informants were criminals and that therefore they had a right to have access to their information? Well, that's all right so far, but an informant is an informant. 
And when you promise confidentiality, you have to keep it. You must remember that these informants are given information about metropolitan detectives. They had been party to corruption with the metropolitan detectives. And they were afraid that if they were identified, and especially identified as to what they had said about some of the detectives, they wondered what might happen to them as a result of that. It was important that the Met didn't get that information. We had given our word. Today, Scotland Yard claim they have virtually completed their own investigation into the scores of cases that they took over from countrymen. Last month, Deputy Commissioner Kavanagh said many of them were malicious or frivolous. And last year, towards the end of the inquiry, he had this to say. It has been a very expensive inquiry. It was a well-meant inquiry. And one thing it has proved conclusively is that the speculation about corruption at a high level and in a widespread manner in the Metropolitan Police are unfounded. The officers in my force who were involved in this exercise uh, gave me the impression that they were appalled by uh, the degree of corruption that was being um, uh, given to them in, in information. Uh, they were checking out a lot of this information. Some of it, of course, was wrong, but some of it was right. Uh, but I think it startled them, quite obviously. Uh, and it was a job they never expected to do and certainly never joined the police to do, to have to spend time not only investigating uh, criminals outside the police, but those inside as well. The Yard detectives who have taken over Countryman's cases belong to a unit called CIB2, the Complaints Investigation Bureau. Yet of Countryman's hundred or so cases they claim to have investigated in the last two years, only one has been brought to court. Mr Kavanagh, meanwhile, says the Metropolitan Police particularly the flying and robbery squad, has never been cleaner. He also claims that CIB2 is the most competent investigating body in the country, a view shared by the Director of Public Prosecutions. But confidence in CIB2's proclaimed determination to investigate countrymen's cases was shaken earlier this year by this man, Joe Cannon, a London criminal. Cannon claimed that flying squad officers stole several thousand pounds recovered from a bank raid in which he took part. A chief inspector from CIB2 came to see me in March. He wanted to talk to me about allegations concerning corruption that uh, they've taken over from countrymen concerning a bank robbery in Hilford 10 years ago that I was on. You actually uh, were one of the robbers who... Yes, yes, I, I, was, I took part in the robbery. And uh, when the police come, and arrest us, about 50 officers come to the flat to arrest us. Uh, there was £3,800 there when the actual case came to court. Only about £800 of that money was declared. £3,000 went missing. And I know that it could only have been taken by the police. Uh, so what happened when the uh, Chief Inspector from CIB came to see you? He just, you know, he told me it was a load of old rubbish and he, he just didn't want to know. Uh, and really, I didn't want to know at that time, you know, and uh, he told me when he left that uh, I wouldn't hear from them no more. Cannon later offers on the phone to make a truthful statement to the CIB2 chief inspector. He tape recorded the conversation, and as the tape shows, the officer does little to encourage him. I mean, let's face it, you and I know what's going on, but I mean, proving it is another thing. Yeah. And, uh, and it's like any other inquiry that, um, if there was corruption and officers were paid, uh, I'm not admitting that they were, but if they were paid um, and they gave what was expected of them, then nobody ever complained, did they? Then the chief inspector tells Cannon that he would only go through the motions of checking out the allegations. And of course, uh, we've got to check that out because yeah. things have gone wrong for countrymen. And uh, obviously there's going to be a shout of whitewash, because uh, we caught most of their stuff. And of course the Met stuff has come back to uh, A10, CIB2 as it is now. And uh, of course they're going to check on that, see if we've done it right. People have gone and they want to bury it. The thing is, that's all finished. It's, it's too long ago. So um, I think all those jobs are uh, buried. Yeah. And 
like I say, mine isn't buried, but it's dead. Oh, but, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's yeah. dead. Countryman detectives do not accept the Yard's claim to have thoroughly investigated all their allegations, particularly about the flying and robbery squad. At his Old Bailey trial, Detective Chief Inspector Cuthbert talked of the extent of past corruption in the Yard. In part of his secretly taped conversation, Cuthbert refers to two former senior Yard officers, one of them a flying squad commander. He says... I used to bung Roy York, Jim Marshall. He used to go up the top of the tree, he used to go up to assistant commissioner. Mainly reward money, obviously. You know, insurance money. Cuthbert also spoke of more recent widespread corruption in the flying and robbery squad. Referring to drinks or money taken from the William and Glynn's robbery in 1977, he says... All the blokes on the robbery squad had a drink out of it, going right to the top of the tree. And all the rest of them all slagging us off. It was a silly drink. It wasn't a big drink. Silly drink. But Cuthbert also spoke of large sums of money going to the flying and robbery squad. When three of the William and Glynn's raiders were arrested, he said... You go and look at the robbery squad that had a drink. Big drinks came in the robbery squad when they nicked Roberts. We're talking about the robbery squad. We're talking about Roberts. When White got nicked. When Wright got nicked. I remember at one meeting, um, which had been arranged by Cuthbert, um, and he was talking to one of the people I was negotiating for, um, who was complaining about the high price he was asking, um, and his answer to that was uh, he pulled his handkerchief out of his top pocket, put it on his shoulder and said, cry on there, you know, uh, either you want to have a trade and you're going to be sensible and you must realise that things like this cost money because uh, there's the city to be paid off, uh, there's the metropolitan to be paid off, uh, and generally saying that higher-ups would have to be given money to make sure that there was a safeguard if there was an inquiry or anything went wrong that it would be smothered up for him and what, for everyone concerned. Was he talking about the Metropolitan Robbery Squad officers involved in the William and Glynn's inquiry that had to be paid? No, he was just saying that people in good positions who would count if there was any sort of inquiry... In would, the Met? Yes, would be willing to cover it up at a price and that price had to be put in to safeguard and make sure that everything would be all right. That's what he was saying in a nutshell, and that costs a lot of money. You don't get that for nothing. If Cuthbert's evidence is right, when he said at the Old Bailey that all members of the robbery squad had had money out of Williams and Glynn's job, then that more than justifies our fears and our apprehensions about the Met when we started off Operation Countryman. Since the Met took it over, the CIB too, they seem to think there's little or nothing in the files that they have dealt with. I have seen it reported that Mr Kavanagh has said that the cases that we handed over were malicious, frivolous and so on. And this makes me very angry. It may make you very angry, but Mr Kavanagh in insists that uh, there is no widespread or deep-seated corruption in Scotland Yard. Do you think he's got it wrong? Well, the evidence that my chaps provided me with indicate to me that there's a lot of corruption in the robbery and in the flying squad. Mr Alderson, you're a former Deputy Assistant, Assistant Commissioner in the Yard. What's your impression of the extent of corruption these days? I'm sorry to say that my impression of the extent of corruption these days is that in spite of all the tremendous uh, work that Robert Mark did, it's more institutionalised than it was. What, what, what exactly do you mean by institutionalised? By institutionalised, I mean that formerly it was in pockets here and there, but I think there are now uh, certain sections uh, of the CID, certain uh, cohorts, if you like, uh, where it's accepted, where the investigations in the past have failed or been frustrated. And I think it's just become, for some of them, a, a way of life. But is that degree of corruption that you suggest does now exist in 
the Met. Is that degree of corruption able to flourish without the knowledge or even the assistance of senior officers in the yard? Indeed, it cannot flourish without the knowledge and probably assistance of senior officers up to a certain level. What? I'm not speaking about the very senior officers in the yard. I'm speaking about the senior operational officers. We invited Sir David McNee, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, his deputy, Mr Patrick Kavanagh, Sir Thomas Hetherington, the Director of Public Prosecutions, to take part in this programme. They all declined. But ten days ago, the Prime Minister had this to say, replying to renewed demands for an inquiry into Scotland Yard corruption. I, Mr Speaker, am very concerned indeed that everyone, but everyone, is hitting out at the police at the moment and would indeed point out that some six police officers have lost their lives in England and Wales this year in carrying out their duties. I bow the knee to no one in my loyalty to the police service. If the morale of the police service depends on failing to reveal things that ought to be revealed in connection with misbehaviour and malpractice, then I want no part of it. Nobody needs to remind me of the gallantry, integrity and efficiency of a high proportion of the police service. But that cannot be used to offset the damage to the reputation of the service done by people who misbehave. It is not the people who draw attention to misbehaviour who are being disloyal and undermining the morale, it is the people who are misbehaving themselves. Well, my first loyalty is to the public of England. And I haven't spoken up before, because until the Cuthbert trial was over, I wasn't free to speak. But now I think it should be brought to notice of this very, very serious problem that has been, and probably still is, in the Metropolitan Police. My duty is the public of England and not the Metropolitan Police. I owe it to all the people and to all the good coppers of this country, the majority of whom are honest and upright to bring this to notice, particularly to the politicians. <laughs>